Greetings and welcome to your place on the river, a podcast brought to you by Carriage Kia of Woodstock, Georgia and featuring Chattahoochee Nature Center. I'm your host, Larry Stevens, a naturalist here at Chattahoochee Nature Center, where our mission is to connect people with nature. CNC is a private, nonprofit 501c3 organization supported by our members, community at large, and listeners like you. To learn more about Chattahoochee Nature Center, visit chatnaturecenter.org. To comment on this podcast, tweet us at CNC Nature and use hashtag YPOTR. Today we'll meet our CNC volunteer coordinator, learn about the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area, find out more about wildlife care, and visit with some volunteers on the CNC 127-acre campus. The CNC's wonderful volunteer coordinator, Patricia Fulton, grew up in Southern California near the San Gabriel Mountains, where she developed a deep and meaningful connection with nature. If you can hike it, bike it, or kayak it, she's in. A writer and designer with a background in communication design, Patricia started working in 2014 in voter outreach and fell in love with community engagement. From 2017 through 2022, she focused on civic engagement and increasing voter turnout in Cobb County and Roswell. After 2022, she decided she needed to return to her true passion, nature. She found a perfect fit with Chattahoochee Nature Center as our volunteer coordinator because it lets her blend her community engagement skills with connecting people with nature. Take a listen as our Liam McCarty talks with Patricia about volunteer opportunities at CNC and the vital part our volunteers play in accomplishing our mission. Hello everyone, this is Liam McCarty and with me today I have Patricia Fulton, the CNC's volunteer coordinator. Hey Patricia, how are you? Hey, how are you? I'm great. (laughs) I'm doing really well. Super excited to have you on the podcast. I think I mentioned this to you earlier. Uh, I'm really excited about this segment specifically because we've heard from all the different departments that we've interviewed all about the great work that the volunteers are doing here. And you're largely responsible for that. Uh, But before we dive into uh, our volunteer work, I'd like to hear more about you. How long have you worked at the Nature Center? I'm actually celebrating my one year anniversary, I think actually today. It's been one year exactly today. (laughs) All right. Congratulations. That's awesome. (laughs) And in the past, uh, you've had some experience in some civil engagement work. How's that prepped you for your work as volunteer coordinator? I'm really comfortable when people say no to me. (laughs) Oh, I bet. (laughs) No, it's helped me. Um, I've worked in civic engagement, getting basically working with people to get out the vote. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that for almost seven years. And it's, you know, it was a wonderful, invigorating. I think what I found is that our, the people in our community are very generous. um, And everyone is really just waiting for you to ask them to get involved. So whether it's, you know, voting or whether it's coming out and volunteering with the Nature Center. People just want to be invited in, and my job is to make that as easy as possible. So if you show up, I want to make sure I get you engaged and get you plugged in in an area where you feel like you're making a big impact. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you can get people out voting, I'm sure you can get people here to this beautiful Nature Center. Yes, this is definitely easier. (laughs) (laughs) De-stressing. For sure. (laughs) Well, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of volunteers on and off of this of the CNC's campus. How do you find all of these volunteers? Well, we're lucky because we actually have a pretty robust program where um, people are coming to us, and that's fantastic. We also utilize um, community groups like YMSL, that's Young Men's Service League, NCL, National Charity League, and they send us hundreds of volunteers. Um, we also work through the environmental clubs in the high, local high schools. Kennesaw State University is involved as well. Mm. And then, um, you know, a lot of the, like, even they come as far, Johns Creek will send us um, from their base the club. Um, Northview will send people from their beta club. So anybody who has an environmental club, they need conservation hours, they want to get involved. And so they'll send us volunteers. Oh, nice. Do you keep track of those hours to uh, send to them? Yes, nice. we do. In fact, NCL was one of our top community partners this year. Oh, awesome. And just from that large database that we had, yes. the people coming from uh, different schools, getting required hours and whatnot, mm-hmm. how many volunteers would we get yearly? Last year, we had over 1,800 individual volunteers show up. I'm sorry, 1,800? 1,800, yes. Oh, that's incredible. A lot of people don't know that our biggest, uh, we have special events. Mm -hmm. So you know how we put on uh, the Butterfly Festival. That's actually one of our biggest volunteer events. And we use over 220 volunteers for that event alone. Oh, my gosh. uh, It's two days. There's two shifts. And we have hundreds of volunteers for it. And then our next one is Halloween hikes. That's also a big one because we get a lot of people out here. And so we want to make sure our volunteers are placed to help with the guest services. And that's... um, 
almost 200 volunteers for Halloween hikes. Oh, that's awesome that those people yeah. are just willing to get up and out here. Yes. And while speaking about getting up, some of the <laughs> my favorite volunteers are the ones who come out for our road races <laughs> because our possum trot in that one, we they get up and they're here by 5.30 a.m. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I said that one wrong. Water drop dash is coming up. That's 5.30. Possum trot, they get here at 5 o'clock in the morning. So those early morning volunteers, those, they have a special place in my heart because not everyone <laughs> Everyone wants to get up at 5 a.m.? For, yeah. for, for sure. I know I'll be getting up at 5 a.m. for those events. Yeah. Uh, I work rentals and special events. Yes, so you do. I, yes. I, I work with you with you a good bit when you uh, bring some volunteers yeah. to help us out. Uh, it's always good meeting them and seeing their point of view. Uh, just coming either for, again, hours or for a required event or right. uh, just because they uh, find it in their heart to come out. That's right. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to go off topic here a little bit. But one of my favorite things when I'm when we just did our first volunteer orientation for 2024 and fantastic group of people that are going to be coming in. And one of the places that I spent time with them is what we call the intersection of everything. Right. I call it no wrong turns. What we do, we have wayfinders that we position in key spots across um, the Chattahoochee Nature Center. And that is a special intersection because if you're trying to get leave the property, if you take a wrong turn at that intersection, you mm. could add a quarter mile to your walk. And if you have small children with you, then you really want to get out of the exit. And so we position volunteers there. And so some of our volunteers like that's a, that's a hard job because you're just standing there waiting for someone to come to you. And so convincing someone that a wayfinder position is just as important is working in the unity garden and harvesting and donating that food. We also need people who are here helping, you know, our our families with small children find that exit or find that bathroom or find the next best place on the, you know, for the special event, you know. For sure. It takes a special kind of person to stand there and wait for people to come by. Exactly. Especially if it's like a summer event. Yeah. It'll be 90 to 100 yes, degrees here. Yes. <laughs> so my, my job is I, I make sure that the volunteers are taken care of. So we make sure we have tents or sun umbrellas. We also, you know, make sure that they have water. And we make sure everyone is paired up in twos so that everyone mm. can take a break. You know, we want them to go ahead and take a break and then come back. And we don't leave those spots open so that, you know, we're helping out. For sure. And just out of my own curiosity, you said finding people for those little waypoint uh, mm -hmm. positions. Wayfinders. Wayfinders. Yes. Wayfinders. Do people volunteer for specific tasks? No. What we usually do is we solicit, like, say, 55 volunteers, right, for a special event. And once we have everyone in, then we'll assign those spots. I mean, if someone has a preference, like, for example, if someone can't be in the heat for long periods of time, then I'll try and make sure that they're in a, you know, air conditioned area. And a lot of times if it's a really hot day, we'll also rotate people so that no one is just set standing there for baking four, in the sun hours. for like an yeah, hour. Yeah. yeah. Well, just walking around the nature center, you can see like actual tangible evidence of our volunteers here. And I think that's really incredible. What are some of the projects that you can see walking around the nature center? Yeah, what I love about that, I was, uh, I know we talked about that last week, <laughs> is that when I'm walking the property, when I'm out on the trail, like all the blazes, the colors on the trees that let you know that you're on the blue trail, red trail, orange trail, we had Fulbright scholarship students come and they helped us with that last year. And so um, like uh, Cox Enterprises came out for a corporate group and they donated um not only their time, but also the supplies to make new picnic tables. So mm. the picnic table areas, whenever I pass by them, I know that we had this big group come out and volunteer there. And then um, the slope, you know, we had Georgia Power came in, put in the, what do you call them, the new... This is where I... <laughs> this is <laughs> Was it up the hill with the, yeah, up the uh, hill. power lines? Yeah, the power lines. That's that's the word, power <laughs> lines. So, yeah, so we had that whole area was completely, you know, like the, the trail was disrupted. Um, we had runoff and everything. Mm. So we had several large groups come through, and not only did they repair the slope, they also helped relay the um, path. We reroute the path, and we also had another group come out. I think it was um, GM came out, and they helped us build a split rail fence to make sure that no one fell off the edge that was created by this new pathway. Mm -hmm. So that's a wonderful, like, every time I'm out, I see these little projects. If you go out by camp, by the pool, the lifeguard stands. Those yeah. were built 
built by uh, Mercedes uh, Benz volunteers. Yeah. Oh, cool! I didn't know that. Yeah. And right. then we have Home Depot. It actually says Home Depot on the shed, but Home Depot comes out and they do work for some of the Kingfisher project as well. So that's what I love about. We have those corporate group volunteers. We also have individual volunteers. We have you know special events. We have um, weekly volunteers who come to the Unity Garden and to the greenhouse, and then we have long-term volunteers who have been here. I mean. 30 years. So our volunteer program is more than 30 years old. And so most of my volunteers have actually been here way longer than I have. So <laughs> I love, start. yeah, awesome. and I love getting to know them because, you know, they know so much more about um, what it means to be part of the CNC family. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like they're coming from all corners of the yes. uh, Atlanta metro community. Yes. And multi-generational. I mean, we mm. have our youngest volunteer is usually 12 years old. We do make exceptions for, say, like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. Mm. So if someone's working toward a badge, we'll make exceptions to, you know, as long as they have a... Um, you know, guardian or parent or a scout leader with them. Mm -hmm. But usually our youngest volunteer is 12 and our, you know, it goes all the way up through every age imaginable. So that's incredible. Incredible. Uh, Before we close out, I want to tie it back into our mission statement Mm -hmm. here at the Chattahoochee Nature Center, and that is connecting people to nature. And in your own words, uh, I'd love to hear about that from the perspective of volunteers. Well, I think that from the way you connect people to nature, if I is you get them to fall in love with something. Mm. And I think when you ask them to come out and spend some of their time and their own sweat equity, that they become attached to something that they're helping to maintain. And when I think about it, I think when you go across the river, say, into Sandy Springs, and you see the urban sprawl that is happening, and sometimes I think about if we weren't protecting 127 acres over here, what would happen? Mm. You know, what would be here in its place? Would it be another subdivision? More would condos, it be condos, apartments. Yeah, like it could be anything. And I think that means that we're doing something important. And I know that historically, um, the U.S. forestry has said that we're losing 18,000 acres of forest a year in the state of Georgia. Mm-hmm. So when you compared to that, protecting 127 acres make, is more important. Yeah. And so I, I hope that I do. I know the staff does. When Every single person that a volunteer encounters when they're on the grounds, I think really loves the Chattahoochee Nature Center and what we're doing here. So I think that that brings them in. And I think that we call it a gateway to nature. <laughs> it's just one of those things. And you can see, because our volunteers have been here for 30 years, some of them, that how important this mission is to protect this place and also to connect other people with nature so that we can continue that foundation of bringing more people in and protecting that thing that they fell in love with. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's almost like a sense of pride uh, from the volunteers because they've worked here for so long and it's still here. These 127 acres. 127 acres. (laughs) As Atlanta keeps growing and growing and growing, this will always be here. Yeah. And I want to mention too, just um, because I know that Larry is here. So, um, (laughs) Larry has been one of our longest volunteers as well, and he also leads our habitat restoration projects throughout the year. And outside of Unity Garden, habitat restoration is one of our top volunteer destinations. Mm. So people really like to feel something tangible. And so clearing those wetlands and getting rid of those invasive species really helps the environment. And they also see the work they've done because they've cleared these these invasive plants out and then they carry them away and then our unity garden we are partnered with um, north fulton community charities and so the volunteers up there they everything that we we grow is donated and so they see that it's very tangible so i think that that's why those two areas are top volunteer destinations yeah, absolutely. We talked to Jacqueline not too long ago about the community garden and the yeah. certain poundage of food that they give. Yes. It's incredible. It's re- it it's really awesome. And a lot of it in part thanks to our volunteers, which full circle well, yeah. and thanks to you. Yeah, well, not to, not to <laughs> me. I'm just, I always say I'm just the scheduler. I, I'm here to make things as easy as possible and to get people where they need to be so that they can make an impact. So Patricia, how does one go about volunteering at the Nature Center? The first step would be to visit our website at chatnaturecenter.org 
And if you go under support, you'll find an option for volunteering and there's an application there. Once you put your application in, you'll receive a welcome letter and then I'll reach out to you. And we have a variety of places that we need volunteers. So in addition to it, like for example, at our special events, we have um, people who do face painting, we do crafts. We have people who actually help. We're in the parking lot. We call that our um, CNC parking squad. <laughs> so if, if that's something that someone's interested in, we could use them there. Um, we're looking for up and coming photographers to help out at special events. We would love some um, new photographers out on the grounds. No, oh, yeah, that's awesome. Just a reminder for you guys to volunteer at the Chattahoochee Nature Center. Just visit www.chatnaturecenter.org. Well, thank you so much for connecting people with nature and connecting people with their community. And thanks so much for uh, sitting in with me and having this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Back to you, Larry. Thank you, Patricia, for the insight into our CNC volunteer programs. You can count on me continuing to put in more than 100 hours annually in various volunteer capacities. The Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area came into being in 1978, two years after the CNC was established. Part of the National Park Service, the CRNRA, encompasses some 10,000 acres along a 48-mile stretch of the Chattahoochee River. The CRNRA and CNC work closely in a coordinated stewardship of our river. Our education program supervisor, Mark Gielanella, is going to speak with Liam about the history and current role of the CRNRA. Hello again, this is Liam, and with me today we have Mark Gilanella, our river interpreter. Hey Mark. Hi Liam. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks. Good, good. Well, today we're going to be talking about a little bit of history. Not just of the Chattahoochee Nature Center, but of the entire CRNRA, the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Just for starters, I know this place has been, the uh, area itself has been here longer than we've been a country, but how far back does the history of this place go? Well, you know, if you want to think about how long there have been uh, people living in the area that became the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area, we're talking about going back to um, 1000 BC, where the population of, of indigenous peoples using the land as their home. Oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, before the actual founding of it, how was this land maintained and used to uh, uh, the benefit of the people who lived here? Sure. Well, you know, uh, uh, like I said, the Native Americans used the land. And then, you know, during the, the 1800s, they were removed on the Trail of Tears. And that was the, mm -hmm. um, the Cherokee Nation that in inhabited this area. And uh, there were forced removals to the area in 1820 and 1832. And then that led to more um, settlers coming into the area north of, of the river and establishing some homesteads and even some mills in the area, such as like the Marietta Paper Mill and other mills along the, the area too, especially as well some, some river crossings where mm -hmm. many of the bridges that crossed the river through the metro Atlanta area were actually originally ferry crossings. Oh, cool. So, you know, you've probably heard of, of, of areas, you know, like Johnson Ferry or things of that nature. And that's where those, those names come from. Well, like actual ferries that were back in the day. Correct, correct. Oh, ferries awesome. to cross the river. Okay, it's cool. So we have Johnson's Ferry. Uh, that's really awesome. Yeah, that is one of the, the crossings. But I actually wanted to mention um, even another one that is uh, over by one of the other units called Powers Island. And this area was actually named after a gentleman named James Power, who in 1835 established Powers Ferry on the Chattahoochee River. And what that did was that actually connected Sandy Springs to Cobb County. Oh. Uh, and it was actually Powers Ferry that was actually used by General Sherman's army in 1864. As I had mentioned, the ferry was eventually replaced by a bridge, and that bridge was, was built uh, back in 1903. And you can see a lot of the ruins of these mills uh, in different locations that you talked about, like the one in Marietta. Right, right. So, yeah, the paper mills um, are through there, and you know, if you go to the... The Soap Creek unit, there's some, some mill ruins. Um, there's also areas where you could actually walk out of some of the park units, and that would link you to, you know, the, the Roswell Mill, which is, which is not part of, of the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area, but you can, you can easily get to it on foot and, and walk in and out uh, through there. There's also, you know, the uh, Allen Brook site, which is part of the Ivy Mill area and just the house is all that remains. You know, thinking about other things that happened here during the, the Civil War, mm. the Chattahoochee River 
was kind of used as a barrier to uh, try and stop General Sherman's advance into Atlanta, but the superior numbers of the, of the Union troops were, were able to actually to overpower that defense. Yeah, absolutely. Sherman's march to the sea. Yeah, exactly. Well, with all this history here, what created the need for this area to become a uh, in the National Park Service? Right. Well, one of the interesting facts is that the units of the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area actually make up 20% of all the metro Atlanta area's green space. Mm-hmm. And so... In the 70s, as the area started to grow, and there was more, like you've heard of, urban sprawl, there was a, a group uh, that called themselves the, the River Rats. That, oh, cool. That organized a need to bring attention to the area, protect the area. And then, you know, since it was in the 70s, you know, our own uh, Jimmy Carter of Georgia was, was mm. president. And in 1978, he was able to designate the area to be the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Okay, so those river rants, President Carter, they were all crucial for this place to become, uh, or for this place to be inducted in the National Park Service. Right, it was, it was formed as a unit of the National Park Service, and it's really very interesting how... When we think about the Park Service, right, National Park Service, Mm -hmm. many comes to mind are places like Yellowstone, Yosemite, Zion, Zion, some of those large, large parks that they all immediately think of. But, you know, the uh, National Park Service right here in their unit here in 2020, you know, it was the 16th most visited national park. They also saw three and a half million visitors. Oh, wow. So in that year, so the impact on the Atlanta area and how busy this protected area is, is really astounding. It's not something that many think of right off the top of your head. And that's why it's so important that, you know, we know this history. We also help protect the park. You know, a lot of efforts for volunteering and creating more uh, accessible areas within the park. You know, for example, thinking of, of history... And just some of like the plans for the park moving forward, you know, they have uh, plans to create even more trails. They currently have a number of trails in the park already, but they are hoping to, in the next 20 years, expand that network from 64 miles of trails to over 90 miles of trails. So, you know, it's not just the history of famous people, famous events that correspond to the history of the country. It's just understanding, too, just the whole history of the park itself and where it's headed in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean it's 48 miles of just beautiful scenery as well. And those trail, that you, it was like, what, you said like 30 extra miles added from 64 to 90? Right, yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot of work. Yeah. And uh, that's going to take a lot of you know, volunteer efforts on the community's part to, to accomplish that. Well, awesome. Well, I'm super excited for these changes coming up just on our back door in the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Ooh, that is a mouthful. Thanks so much for uh, talking with me, Mark, and sharing some history. Sure thing. All right, back to you, Larry. Thank you, Mark and Liam. Dealing with injured wildlife can be fulfilling and rewarding, as well as complicated, heartbreaking, and exhausting. While some of the work our CNC Wildlife team does is very clear-cut and straightforward, there are also many nuances and gray areas that can complicate issues. With that in mind, there are several actions and behaviors that the general public can do to ensure wildlife safety should they find an animal they believe is in need. Here's our wildlife rehabilitator, Jeremy Meneapanda, to discuss this important subject with our Liam. Hello again. This is Liam, and with me today we have Jeremy Meneapanda from our wildlife segment, here to talk to me about wildlife philanthropy and the best intentions in wildlife care. Hey, Jeremy, how are you doing today? Hey, Liam, what's up? I spoke to Catherine Dudek, our wildlife director here, a few episodes back. Uh, We spoke about just the clinic in general and how it really takes a special kind of person to do this job. I mean, she talked about how many hours you guys put in, how much of your time goes into it, and how much of yourselves you really put back into this clinic and honestly the ecosystem. Yeah, without doubt, without doubt. One of the big things that people don't oftentimes really consider with us is that animals don't celebrate holidays. They don't care that it's Christmas or Thanksgiving or that it's the 4th of July. So they still need their food. They still need their medication. So we still got to work. So we are here every single day of the year, no matter what, one of, one of the members of our staff. So it's certainly a commitment, but there's a lot of fulfilling points of it too. As well. Yeah, I could imagine. I could imagine. So you get a lot of animals in uh, at the wildlife clinic, dozens and dozens of them. And most of them aren't in the best shape. 
unfortunately. What kind of complications do you uh, face when caring for these animals? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one of the hard parts that we have is that no one brings us a healthy hawk and it's like, hey, check this thing out. It's awesome, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. We get animals that are injured, and they're injured so severely that pretty much anybody can get them contained into a container and bring them to us for care. So we don't see the animals in their best shape for sure. And probably one of the biggest hurdles we have when we're when we're rehabilitating them is that we don't speak their language and they don't speak our language Mm -hmm. so we have to try and figure out what's wrong with them and that's even complicated a little further with wild animals particularly birds as it turns out when your dog gets sick you could kind of tell you could see the behavior changes a little bit they may limp they may cough they may seem a little more depressed or lethargic we don't have that type of history with the animals that come in here, so we have to kind of guesstimate that they're doing poorly or doing okay and are alert and are depressed or are lethargic or they're in shock or you name it. There's a lot of intuitive processes we have to go through in order to figure that out. And kind of backtracking a little bit, we mentioned that they're wild animals, which makes it a little harder. Wild animals by design, if you will are programmed to hide their illnesses, particularly animals that are going to be prey. Because if a wild animal shows that it's sick or it's injured and it slows down and it starts limping, those predators are looking for that type of thing. So they'll cue in on that animal and they'll aim for that animal first. So when these animals become sick, they don't show it to us. They don't say to them, you know, us, hey, I I feel a little cough today. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. They hide it and act normal as long as they can. So usually when we start seeing symptoms, it's sometimes even too late. So it's a really complicated matter of kind of trying to solve a puzzle with your eyes closed. Like I said, when we get these animals in, you got to think that someone who's got no experience with wildlife whatsoever was able to catch them, contain them, put them in a box and get them to us. These animals are in pretty tough shape. So it, it's we certainly start behind the eight ball, so to speak. For sure, yeah. The untrained eye, even seeing that it's sick, is an issue. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Well, again, you guys see dozens and dozens of animals here with a slurry of different reasons as to why they uh, were taken to the clinic. What would you say is the most common? Well, that's a tough one. We get a lot of reasons. Unfortunately, almost all the reasons the animals come in are, are human-related, so to speak. And it may be active. It may be passive. And I guess I'll explain that a little bit. Probably one of the most common incidents we get are car strikes. Mm -hmm. These animals are hit by cars. These animals don't realize that roadways are dangerous. Um, It's just another thoroughfare for them. So they're going to get on the road. They're going to try and cross the road. For example, turtles, box turtles. Most people see box turtles crossing the road. Box turtles do not understand that that car coming down the road can easily kill them. They just are trying to cross that pathway. Birds of prey. They oftentimes will get hit by cars. I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You think these birds of prey flying in the trees, how are they getting in the road? Well, people will do things like throw an apple core or some french fries or something out their window thinking it's biodegradable or an animal's going to eat it. I'm doing, I'm doing some good. And I could appreciate that, that train of thought. However, when those rodents are drawn to the roadway, that draws the predators of the rodents, which are these birds of prey. And when they see that food item, they kind of get tunnel vision and they just target on it and they go down there and they are not aware that that car coming down the road is not going to stop or slow down or may not even see them. And so obviously these cars can do a lot of damage to these animals. That's probably one of the biggest incidents that we get that causes a lot of the injuries in the wildlife we get. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean th- to have no concept of what like a road is or even these huge things flying towards them back and forth. Absolutely. Uh, I spoke to Catherine not too long ago. It was on a uh, a topic, a, a, a way of thinking that was like, why not let nature take its course with these animals? And she said to me, that's not nature. Car strikes, that's not nature. Like in, any like human interference, that isn't part of the whole cycle. Absolutely correct. So you really need to differentiate the difference between human interaction or human involvement and natural causes. A turtle laying 30 eggs and having 30 baby hatches and having only two of them make it to adulthood is nature Mm. because those juveniles that may not survive feed other animals, and that's a part of the natural cycle. However, a turtle crossing the road getting hit by a car is not. Mm. It is a very, very artificial interaction with a human event. And of course, humans are part of nature as well, but we have to separate those two when we're considering it. Even things like one of the box turtles, big problems that we get from them is they get these infections in their ears and their eyes, 
And the primary reason for it is they're walking across people's lawns that they spray pesticides on the lawn to try and get rid of the crabgrass or the mm. insects that may be breeding in there. Not thinking that that can cause a definite harm to the wildlife. Uh, the turtles will incidentally get it in their eyes and absorb it through their, their membranes and ingest it. And it causes these infections in their eyes and their ears, which incapacitates them. Again, very incidental, not intentional, obviously. But if it could be avoided, it certainly can help to not cause these problems with these turtles. That's something that we try and get out there a lot because sometimes people don't really add one and one and get two to that manner. And I don't blame them because mm -hmm. it's kind of a interesting little gateway that that, that pathway follows. But... It's absolute correlation. Yeah, um, you, you don't think that you're going to hurt some other animals by spraying pesticide on your lawn, et cetera, and things like except that. Except the, you know, like you think, okay, yeah. the, 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 the pesticides are going to get rid of the pests, mm -hmm. but you don't think about the collateral that may happen with it. And we see it and we try and inform the people. And, and that's basically, you know, all we can do is try and help the animals on the way and then actually try and help educate people, which is remarkably very effective. A lot of people, once they realize, hey, this action I've been taking, which has been incidental, is actually causing harm, They the light bulb goes on over their head. Oh, yeah. And they, they swear up and down, I'm never, ever going to do that again. And I believe a lot of them, you know, like it's pretty profound. Yeah. With that said, what are some preventative measures that people can take to uh, make wildlife a little safer around them? Well, I, like we were talking about, you know, these animals don't comprehend that they're going to be in harm's way with a lot of these situations. You know, that old adage that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure really plays off here. I'm trying to do things like not apply those pesticides to your lawn. If you're driving along and you see a turtle in the roadway and you think it's safe, obviously you need to keep yourself safe and the people around you safe. Mm -hmm. If you could pull your car over to the side of the road and move that turtle in the direction it's going, that's going to help it off that roadway and out of harm's way. You got to make sure you're going in the direction it's going, though. If you put it on the side of the road it came from, It'll as soon as go. you leave, you've actually increased the chances it's going to get hurt. Like, oh, as gosh, soon as it like leaves, it. Yeah, so, so make sure you do that. One of the probably lesser known risks that people put out that may put wildlife in harm's way is garden netting. They put it around their, their decorative gardens or their vegetable gardens or something to keep out the rabbits and the deer and things like that. And that netting causes a lot of harm. Um, mm. Snakes get caught in it very, very readily. And as it constricts on them, they try and escape it a little more and it just cuts right into their body. Snakes are an incredibly valuable part of the, the ecosystem. And without them, there'd be a lot of other problems that you just don't want to have. A lot of rodent overruns, things of that nature. They, they serve a very critical part of the ecosystem. So things like that, not using that garden netting, it would be a huge, huge benefit using other methods. There's there's automated sprinklers or motion activated sprinklers to keep the predators away or um, a little more robust solid netting rather than that monofilament garden the, netting. The really thin one that they yeah. can just like squeeze through. Okay. Yeah, it's it's made to be invisible and not visually intrusive, oh. uh, but it's it's catastrophic for these animals. So trying to limit that type of thing. Two of my pet peeves for, for what people can do, first thing is is poisons, when people put out poisons for animals. Poisons are just horrible, horrible things. Even for the target animals they go after, they just cause terrible problems inside the body and cause a very painful, slow, problematic death for these animals. Mm. There's so many more appropriate and more humane ways of handling that. But even with that, if a rodent eats a mouse poison, let's say, and then goes out in the field, and then that hawk eats the rodent, it has ingested that poison. Oh, and man. that has this cumulative effect as you go up the food chain. A lot of people know that a lot of seafoods you want to be careful of because there's certain toxins that will build up in tuna and in things like barracuda, things of that nature. Same principle applies here, except we're obviously not eating these birds, but it can easily cause them irreparable organ damage, yeah. which which is catastrophic, obviously. It goes back to like the pesticide thing we were saying. We don't think it has those kinds of consequences, but... Absolutely right. So there's things you could do for rodents. You know, you want to don't offer them food. There's ultrasonic repellers that just emit a noise that will try and keep them away. Oh, cool. There's non-aggressive methods of, of handling them. Probably one of the best methods, though, is just to welcome their natural predators. Welcome the snakes, welcome the <laughs> hawks into your yard. They're going to keep those rodents in check. The other thing that I, I really wish somehow in my in my deepest dreams they get rid of and make illegal at some point are sticky traps they're glue traps that you put on the ground sometimes they're for insects they are the definition of an indiscriminate killer because mm. whatever gets stuck in them is probably going to permanently be stuck in it until it dies or someone brings it to me and i can get it out and we've had so many cases of people bringing us animals even animals we don't work with under the purview of our license songbirds 
that are stuck in these glue traps that it's just incredibly stressful. If they're lucky, they're still doing well and we can get them off and get the glue removed from them and get them released. If they're not, they just die a very, very painful, long, prolonged, scary death. We got a glue trap in maybe about a year and a half or two years ago that had a king snake on it, an eastern king snake, which is a great native snake. They actually eat venomous copperheads. I mean, oh, wow. I don't even know how to express the value of an animal like <laughs> yeah. that. It had an eastern king snake on it that was still alive, thankfully, and it had 19 native lizards stuck to it, in addition to about a 1,000 little bugs. This thing was just there for just so long covered. in someone's garage. And a number of the lizards were, were deceased at this point. Um, it was just kind of a sad horrible kind of disturbing trophy of how terrible these traps are because i'm sure it was put in the garage to maybe catch a mouse or maybe catch some insects but instead it had captured all these non-target animals and you don't know until it's too late Mm -hmm. um so those are some of the things that i think people can do to help try and protect wildlife with again it's a little it's proactive an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure for sure i love that Uh, There are so many ways that these animals can get hurt, but hopefully there are some ways that we can help. Uh, And if you're in the circumstance where you find an injured animal, what's the correct protocol for that? Uh, Great question. And I'm very glad you asked that because (laughs) there's a lot of misunderstanding with this. First and foremost, contact a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. We have to be licensed to do this from the state of Georgia, the Department of Natural Resources. And they actually will put out a list that has all the licensed rehabbers and what type of animals they can work with. So we get a lot of training and a lot of experience and a lot of expertise and a lot of cooperation in order to be able to handle cases like this. A lot of times people will kind of see an in, like they may be driving around and see an injured hawk or an owl or you name it and take it home just to say, okay, I got to get this care and then just in their brain, they kind of think, I can do this. Like, mm. I can have an owl in the house. is going to be great. They're majestic animals. It's, it's understandable. These animals have such specialized care, and it's just not an appropriate thing to try and do it themselves. And probably one of the greatest analogies I've ever heard for this was if I were driving down the road and I passed by a park and I saw a guy running and he fell and broke his leg, I wouldn't scoop him up into my car and drive him home and put him in my basement and be like, I could fix him. I got it. I got it. I would call yeah, the ambulance. Be, that'd be wild. Yeah, it, would yeah. be, it would be incredibly inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, I would call the ambulance. I would call the doctors. I would take him to the hospital. I would do things that would get him professional, appropriate care. That type of train of thought needs to apply to wildlife, too, because, mm. like I said, we are thoroughly trained to help care for these animals. And sometimes people tell us some stories, again, with best intentions. They are trying to help these animals. But tell us these stories that my eyes must look like the little things in the jackpots in Las Vegas. They're just rolling in my head. All these things online about people finding this animal in their backyard, taking it in, taking care of it, and like documenting the whole thing. This is the part in the segment where we take a bit of a darker turn, but it's one that I think should be discussed and honestly normalized. Yeah. Uh, What happens when you get an animal that can't be rehabilitated? Yeah, so that's that's the truth of it. Like we talked about at the beginning of the segment here, I see animals in their worst case. I don't see the soaring eagles, so to speak. I do, but not <laughs> just not in my hands, you know. Sometimes animals sustain injuries that we can't help them with. We have an interesting requirement for our licensing that our job is to take in wildlife if we can rehabilitate it so that it can be released to the wild in its natural state. That means being able to move around normally, evade predators, get food, And in the perfect world, reproduce, Mm -hmm. uh, pass on its genes. If we get into an animal that we deem that that is just not possible, we cannot legally rehabilitate that animal. There is only one unfortunate recourse for that, which is safe and humane euthanasia. It's not something we like doing. I mean, we're in the business of fixing these animals and getting them back out in the wild. That is what we really want to do. It's probably one of the worst parts of our job is the fact that sometimes these animals, we just can't help them but that is the best thing for these animals. If a bird has lost its wing, it cannot be released to the wild because it cannot fly and it cannot evade predators and it cannot get food. And we cannot choose to simply help this animal to keep it in captivity. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, we do have animals that are in captive situations that are non-releasable. And there's an important distinction to make with this is that those animals that we have, we 
believed that they could be released when we started the rehabilitation process. And in the process of evaluating them, we determined, hey, this animal's vision is corrupted. It can't, with good acuity, find its prey. Hey, its flight is somehow compromised because of this missing part of its wing, so it can't navigate well through the woodlands that it normally lives in. There's something that we discovered in the process of rehabilitation that somehow negates release. All these animals have to go through a, you know, like a trial, so to speak, a, mm-hmm. you know, testing to see that they can live in the wild. And should they fail it, that's when we could say, okay, this animal can be placed in a permanent home as a non-releasable animal. But that's not something we can do. If someone brought me the coolest bald eagle on earth, and I just said, wow, this thing is great, but I know for a fact that I am not going to be able to help this animal so that it can be released, I'm legally not permitted to rehabilitate it. And that's for good reason. Uh, There's a good reason the licensing allows that, but it's a tough part of our job. But when all said and done, all wildlife rehabilitators understand that sometimes the best thing for these animals is a safe and painless humane euthanasia. Hmm. Um, It's a release of sorts. It's actually something we're very, very thoroughly trained on during our, our licensing process is that humane euthanasia is a very normal and safe and effective and humane source of release for a lot of these animals. Absolutely. Well, that about does it for this segment. But before we close out, I was wondering if you had anything, uh, any words of parting wisdom for the listeners out there? There is. There's a couple things. I know I've, I know I've kind of got on my soapbox a lot for this section. But... Oh, you stay on your soapbox. Love it. <laughs> Good. I've been waiting to hear that. <laughs> uh, one of the things, first and foremost, I, I've said this a couple times, but I can't express this enough. I appreciate people trying to help. And I appreciate that the fact that they may not have the skill set that other people may have. I have this kind of interesting analogy, I call it my airline pilot analogy, where I'm sure if I went into the cockpit of an airplane, I would just be dumbfounded at all the buttons and knobs and dials, and I'd be like, who, and this is fake. There's no way anybody (laughs) can know what all this stuff does. And that pilot would look at me and say, you're an idiot. This is simple. Like, you just flip this and do this, but they know their job. That is common sense to them. I apply that when I have people that may bring some wildlife to me, the fact that, hey, just some, because I know something very simply and very cognizantly doesn't mean that anybody else does. And it's, I can't hold it against anybody that they're not aware of these things. In the same way, I don't know what that little knob on the airplane does. They don't know that giving this animal the wrong food is going to be harmful. Mm. Like I, I 100% get it, and I will never criticize someone for trying to help. Um, I'm hopefully trying to give them some better mechanisms to get quicker, more effective help. And the last soapbox item I got for you, (laughs) um, it involves another interesting case that we have here that we get a lot of every year. Um, Mm -hmm. It's one of the turtles that we have in in our native waterway. We're on the Chattahoochee River here. Huge, like a a melting pot of of wildlife out there. Absolutely, Uh, One of the species that we get that's found out in native waterways a lot is actually a non-native animal. It's the red ear slider. It's a turtle. And they're almost always kept as pets originally. You Mm. can buy them in a lot of sources. They're a beautiful turtle. But unfortunately, a lot of people buy them, and they grow tired of them pretty quickly. And when we're lucky, people contact us and say, hey, I have this turtle. I don't really think I could care for it anymore. We're able to bring in that turtle, get it rehabilitated to be released in its native range, which is not here in Georgia. It's the only non-native species we work with here at Chattahoochee Nature Center in the Wildlife Department. They're native to the Mississippi River watershed. Okay, yeah. So we're able to rehabilitate them, and then through cooperation with other wildlife organizations, and sometimes us just getting on the road and driving for many hours in a day, <laughs> we hit that watershed, and we're able to release these animals once they pass all our trials. Awesome. Um, hopefully, with all the stuff that we've just, all the belly aching I just carried on about <laughs> over the past, we can get some people on our side of the fence, where they're, they're thinking in the wildlife aspect, um, again, Not even maliciously, not even intentionally trying to do things that might not be great, but hopefully now it's in their mind and they can move forward. And maybe next time that that company calls to spray their lawn, they say, no, I don't want that anymore. Or when they're putting the the garden netting out, they think about it twice. Or when they're driving down the road, they say like, hey, I'm going to be a little more vigilant. I'm not going to throw my apple core out the window, you know, because Mm -hmm. that's going to just cause harm when all is said and done. If if we get one person to to do that, that's, that's okay in my book. 
Yeah, absolutely. Again, with the best intentions, but now uh, educated, they can contact uh, you or other re- uh, absolutely. rehabilitators. Absolutely. Re- rehabilitators. And even with that, even with that, just, hey, hey, I see a baby owl in the tree. I'm a, I think he's probably okay. A lot of times, and I hope everybody does this, if you see a baby owl in a tree, watch it from a distance. I would bet you're going to see mom and dad come down and feed it, which is even cooler on top of cool. Like <laughs> oh, I bet. The fact that you get to see that. Check up on the trees for the nest. You may see its siblings. You may see that nest, like the actual nest. There's a lot of cool things you can just observe just from a distance without actually involving yourself in that is an incredible connection with nature. You know, that's that's something we obviously hope to foster. For sure. And that's all what we're all about here, connecting people with nature. Well, uh, thanks so much for talking with me, Jeremy. It's been awesome having this conversation. Yeah, man. All right. Back to you, Larry. Thank you, Jeremy, for enlightening us with regard to helping wildlife. Now let's head outside and catch up with our favorite field guide, Scott Tracy, who is chatting with some CNC volunteers about what they do here and why. Thank you, Larry. I'm out here in the field on another beautiful day at the Nature Center in our lovely Unity Garden. This garden donates on average hundreds of pounds of produce to a local food shelter and attracts dozens of volunteers to come spend their mornings here and it's easy to see why. Today I'm going to plant myself among some of our regular volunteers and see what it's like to help out a little. I've covered myself with dirt to fit in and stay cool. Let's hope I do, lest I get labeled a weed. Let's go. Well, I've made it to one of the gardening beds. Hello, ladies. Uh, I'm prepared to take up the gardener's kneeling position. I have my trowel in hand. What else do I need to get started here? Here's some um, soil-free. Oh, yeah, we need that. Well, here, if you'll get a bucket, I'll give you half of this. Okay. We're putting salt free in every hole, you know. Well, I got a little excited there, didn't I? Well, you could, you could scatter it around the outside edge. Yeah, and it'll water in. We're going to have 20 pounds of soil free, uh, 20 bags of soil free this year, so she wants to use it up. Yeah, I guess that stuff's been a, a real change yep. up here. It's a huge booster in growth. That's awesome. We're staggering them, right? Yeah, like four, three. Stagger them. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's five, four, five, five, but I've ran out, so. Ah, I okay, okay. Three. I see. I, I see. <laughs> this is a runt if I've ever seen one. <laughs> I would say a blessing over that one. <laughs> <laughs> Grow and be pot choy. Oh. Uh, okay, so that's what this is. This is bok choy here. I think this is pot choy, which is. Oh, with a P. With a P, mm. which is smaller and different somehow, but I don't know the difference. It's right. the same. Not all seedlings are created equal. No, but you know what? It's the little pot choy that could. What kind of lettuce is this? It's purple. Red lettuce. I mean, it's red. <laughs> red lettuce. Nice. Oh, so, you've been here a while, Marion. How did you get started here? My husband and I moved to Atlanta in 75. Wow. And the Nature Center was just opening. And we kind of got in on the ground. We didn't really volunteer or anything, but we are like, this is a cool thing. And we came out here all the time. And we were, it was kind of like a cool place for us. And for my birthday one year, he gave us shrubbery with my name on it. And it's oh, still down there. Oh, it here. Oh, I got it. And so then, fast forward, my husband dies five years ago. Um... And I came to the Nature Center. I just didn't know what to do, so I thought yeah. maybe I can be of some help here. And I volunteered for every, 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 everything. And um, this is where I wound up. Yeah. And it's just the best thing because I've got friends and all. But I really liked it, but I thought, well, let's just see. I was just going to do one day. And let's just see what else there is. And so every time they send out a volunteer thing, like help hand out T-shirts or address envelopes or whatever at a festival i did pretty much all of them i did that was like star volunteer that way because i did uh, yeah. a little bit of I mean, that year did a little bit of everything yeah so then i decided yeah this is what i want to do and so it's coming every tuesday and then it got busy with covid the weeds got ahead of us and so we started coming on thursdays and that was supposed to be just a temporary thing but you know, you know how that goes right yeah once we once we convinced the volunteers to start coming they don't seem to stop. 
I don't know, it's just, it's just a special place, and I'm just glad to be part of it. I think so, too. And on behalf of the Nature Center, we're happy to hear it's been such a source of fulfillment for you. When I first retired, it was like, I was a teacher, that, that's what I was, I was a teacher, but people said, oh, you can substitute, or oh, you can tutor the homeless, or oh, it's like, no, nah, I don't want anything to do with teaching anymore, I want to... Yeah, that's, that, that's like with me, I, I want to do something different. It's time for something you different. Know. Yeah, well, we get a pretty long life, so it's almost kind of silly to do the same thing the whole time. Yeah, and I like to challenge myself, you know, do things I'm not necessarily comfortable with, but at least try it. Do you find this work challenging? Oh, this, this is great. Oh, yeah. yeah, everything's always changing with the weather, the yeah. soil, the sun. And yet I like being outside. And... Right. <clears throat> so I don't think we've planted the same thing in the same place. <laughs> oh, and I've learned Many so times. much about different vegetables. I mean, oh, I know. I've learned so much. I just do it to go out and play in the dirt and feed people. Right. Yeah, that's the nice thing. Too. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. If you see the direct result of your efforts. This is like, this is the nature center and it has a reputation and True. you don't want to, you want to do a good job. Yeah, there's something for everybody here. <laughs> right. You can always go do something else here if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. It's like fluid. Yeah, I like that. So if you guys were to encourage somebody to volunteer here, what would you uh, tell them that they might not uh, expect? Here's what I did not expect. I expected to, just to come and get some work done, and I was doing good for the world and all that. But that's not it, it at all. It's like it's the camaraderie. I have friends here, and it's like I come because I want to do this, but I also don't want to let my friends down. No. Oh. Um, it's just a family up here that I didn't expect. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Ditto. <laughs> That's what's nice about out here. Listen to that. That bird is just so happy. That's what I mean. You just hear so much and see so much of nature. And if you want to identify it, you certainly can. If not, you can just appreciate it. Right. That's something that I'm a, a big proponent of. Even though you're in a garden, you do see and hear a lot of nature. Right? Oh, yeah. All the time. Well, and we even find bunny nest. The bunnies were not supposed to be in no, here, but they were so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. You know. You Competing know interests. Kind of well, and there's so insects. many knowledgeable people around, it's like, oh gosh, what do you think that bird is? Oh, that's a yellow-throated Somebody knows. flicker or something. I don't yeah. know. And, I mean, you just learn all this stuff about plants and animals and yeah. interesting about nature. Because it's a <clears> lot of experts around here, and if I don't know, somebody else knows, or if they don't know, we go ask Henning. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one thing I, I didn't, I guess, expect either when I started working here was just how many authorities on anything there are around, you know. And that's cool that you feel you get it, too, just volunteering, you know. Yeah. Just in this one and space. It is. You just feel great about taking food to hungry people. And when I drive it to the to the uh, North Fulton Community Charities. You see all the people coming out with things, and it's just like, yeah, this is good. Yeah. And then they always, at the, at the, the people who help me take it in, always say, oh, this is the only fresh vegetables we've gotten all week or something. I'm currently standing underneath what becomes our cucumber tunnel, a nice trellis in the middle of our garden that also supports climbing beans and peas talking with one of our veteran volunteers. So tell me, how long ago did you start volunteering here? I've been here 10 years. Okay. How would you say it's changed since you first started? Oh, much better than it was. We've done a lot of improvements to help the vegetables grow better. So every year we learn more and do a better job. Right. Yeah, so I mean with longtime volunteers like yourself, you're kind of helping compound the knowledge. Well, hopefully. <laughs> I'm sure. You feel like when you started, you 
came in with a lot of experience or you came in just... I had zero experience. Wow. Everything I've learned, I've learned here or I also belong to community garden that I've learned from. And I share my knowledge from both gardens with the other garden. Of course. That's awesome. How do you feel like here compares with the community garden you work with? That's probably more like a, a group of people, not really a collective. Right, it's much smaller. And we do donate to a food bank, but we don't have nearly as much as we get here at the Nature Center. Is it a similarly sized garden? Oh, no. Okay. No, it's about maybe a sixth the size okay. of this. Yeah, this is kind of a very large operation. Mm-hmm. Well, that's cool. It's good to know that you didn't feel like you had to know something before you came here. So, I mean, that's that's good for anybody who would be interested in coming but thinks there's like some sort of barrier to entry. Well, to tell you the truth, I wanted to work in the native plant area. And the person that was in charge of that was on maternity leave at the time. And they said, but we need help in the garden. So I started working here and I just caught the bug. Didn't want to leave, so. Right. Yeah, that's kind of one of the themes at the Nature Center. You go where you're needed and you find out that's a good place too. Well, and new people that come, we usually buddy them up with an experienced person. Okay. So they can learn and uh, don't get totally lost in it because we have a lot of people that don't know anything about gardening. Right. Uh, Just like I was. But then we have some people that do have some experience that jump right in. Yeah, they already know what to look for and Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, they know how to plant and what's a weed and what's a plant kind of thing. Right. But I don't imagine it takes long to get feeling comfortable around here. Um, Probably not, but every season brings something new, new vegetables, so you have to learn. Sure. Um, how far apart to plant them and when to harvest them and whether you harvest the whole plant versus just some leaves from it. So it's always a learning process. And we've always had great supervisors here that want you to learn, so they're always willing to educate you. And if they don't know the answer, they go find it. Yeah, I've been hearing from everybody in the garden so far that they're very happy with the level of organization and the leadership and all that. Yep. It's definitely and they're very flexible on schedules, you know, if you've got an appointment or you can only come for an hour and not three hours, you know, everything's fine. Whatever you can, whatever time you can volunteer works out. And we have people that have back problems or knee problems and then we don't give them stuff that stresses that out. There are all right. kinds of jobs that they can do. Right. That's one of the reasons we put raised beds in is because some people were having back problems and then the raised bed they can sit on the edge and do whatever and they don't have to strain their back. Nice. You're really making it sound like anybody can come and do this. Yep. Just as long as they have the desire. So what would you say an average morning in the garden is like? There's something different every day. Yeah. In the summer is harvest, plant, and weed. That's all we do all summer. Right. In the winter time, protecting the plants from the cold and a little bit of weeding, but they don't have as many weeds in the winter. The plants grow slower, so there's not as much harvesting. So there may be greenhouse work where we are seeding new plants or taking seedlings and putting them into bigger pots, getting ready for the plant sale, that kind of thing. Right. And also, there's maintenance and as far as the beds sometimes have to be kind of straightened out. The wood gets out of shape and things like that. Or we have to put mulch down on the pathways, but usually we get volunteer groups to do the heavy labor stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, we do. We are very fortunate to have so many corporate groups come in and, Mm -hmm. I mean, really it's just a matter of manpower, just number of people. We have some really good corporate groups that come in and do work. They know what they're doing. 
Yeah, I've spent a lot of time with uh, a lot of the, a lot of the corporate groups, whether it's up here in the garden. I've built some of the raised beds with them, and uh, yeah, they don't they don't always know what they're doing, but they're they're willing to learn and, and have fun along the way. So always get the job done eventually. So, do you specifically work in the greenhouse much? Uh, only when Coles needs me to. Gotcha. I like working in the greenhouse, but there's usually so much work out here that if the weather's nice, I really prefer to be out here. Right. If the weather's nasty, then a lot of times we'll work in the greenhouse. That makes sense to me. Yeah, I'd say quite enough of the time it is very beautiful to be out here and be up here and hear the birds and the bugs and the bees. And the chickens. Ah, yes, and the chickens. Well, I think uh, I think you've convinced me that it's inspiring to come here. Hopefully our listeners will feel that as well, and uh, maybe you'll be meeting some new folks up here because of this. That'd be nice. And now, like the vegetables, I finally made it over to our gathering table, a finish line, if you will, where all the seed started produced is weighed and bagged to be shipped off to those in need. Standing here with me is one of our newer volunteers, but certainly recognized having received last year the title of the number one horticultural volunteer. Wow. How does it feel to be bestowed such a title? Well, like, you know, because I've been, I come here Tuesdays and Thursdays, mm -hmm. so you know, I guess it backs up the hours. Yeah. A few of you come yeah. Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then Wednesdays I come. Oh, and then Wednesdays too. Okay, yeah. with Henning. All right, all right. Well, that wraps up a lovely morning in the Unity Garden with some fantastic volunteer testimonials. Garden clippings, shall we say. I hope to make my way back up here soon and see some new faces, perhaps those of our listeners. For now, back to the studio. Okay, that's it for this episode of Your Place on the River, which is brought to you by Carriage Kia of Woodstock, Georgia, and features Chattahoochee Nature Center, where our mission is to connect people with nature. Remember to learn more at any time about Chattahoochee Nature Center and what's happening here. Please visit chatnaturecenter.org. That's C-H-A-T-T, -T, naturecenter.org. We also invite you to share any questions, suggestions, concerns, or compliments about our podcast by tweeting us at CNC Nature and use hashtag YPOTR. This podcast is a production of BG Ad Group. All rights reserved.